Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, and this is Beyond the Lines. We broadcast live on Mondays from the beautiful Think Tech Hawaii TV studio in the Pioneer Plaza in downtown Honolulu. This show is based on my book, which is also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about creating a superior culture of excellence, leadership, achieving greater success and sustaining that greater success, and finding greatness. Today's special guest, Wes Reber Porter, is a great example of all of this. He is a former trial attorney, a law professor, and president and CEO of Damien Memorial School. Wes is extremely successful, and he is having a huge positive impact with all students and faculty at Damien Memorial School. And today, we are going beyond education. President Wes, great okay. having you today. Great to see you. Great now, to be here. You know, I, I'm a graduate of Damien School, as you know, and very proud and very proud of everything that you've been doing for the last three years as president of Damien. Um, I want to know your history. I want to know your youth. Can you share with me what happened in the early days of President West? Sure, and, uh, and we're proud to have you as our alumni. I can tell you that, uh, that you make Damien proud, the show makes Damien proud, especially the, the lessons of this book make Damien proud. Thank so. you. Um, going back with me, I, I think I, I had a pretty typical childhood. Um, I was very involved in, in anything, uh, anything that involved sports and getting out there and interacting with friends. I was lucky that I came before uh, the, the draws of the, the, the cell phone in our pockets and the <laughs> video games. I was an outdoor, get outside and, and play with others type of person. Uh, I grew up in New England. I grew up in Rhode Island. Uh, I was I was blessed to uh, I went to public schools almost all the way through and then I went to a school that's actually in Damien's network so I went to a Christian Brothers school a, a faith-based school in New England uh, in Rhode Island and I think it just opened up lots of things for me it, it allowed me to interact with different coaches different programs and really get out there and start to uh, start to understand how the world works beyond my tiny pocket that I live in. <laughs> So are you a big uh, New England Patriots fan? I am. I am. Patriots, Red Sox, it's very busy this time of the year for us, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and Celtics as well. But we've moved around quite a bit, and now that I have uh, young boys, wherever we seem to live and the, and the teams that they're into, I have to, uh, I have to get on that bandwagon as well. But <laughs> I, I try to have a, a little bit of my roots come through in the sports teams I root for. So what kind of sports did you play when you were growing up? Uh, I like to answer this question first by sort of everything and anything that was going on in the neighborhood. I, I, was, I was one of those kids that was just outside in the middle of the street yelling car when, uh, when they were coming through and we'd, and we'd clear out and it was whatever was going on. I, uh, I loved playing with kids that were older. I loved playing what they, what they were good at more so than what I was into. Uh, it narrowed down eventually, uh, soccer, basketball, golf, tennis, it, it kind of narrowed down. and. And then as we go on, uh, it went into high school and college, it became sort of basketball as a primary sport. So what college did you end up going to? I went to a small school in New Hampshire called St. Anselm College. And for me, uh, my background was uh, I was recruited for basketball and it was really, you know, what are the, the schools and what's going to be the best educational choice for me to continue playing and, and get a good education at the same time. So did you major in communications, what did you major in? I majored in business, but then I found my way to uh, a minor in uh, psychology and sociology, a human relations minor, so I was always sort of interested in the business side of things, uh, how it worked in the real world, uh, some early indications there that I was trying to figure out. Uh, yeah, communications was part of it, sociology was part of it, psychology was part of it, so it was more than just a straight uh, business econ degree. Okay, and then you became a trial attorney. Um, how, did, how did that evolve? Yeah, I think, it, it, I, I think of it now as those early sparks in education that we hope to provide for our own students all the time. I, I went to one class, uh, a public speaking type class, and I had some connections. I made sure to take it, uh, just like playing sports with those older kids in our neighborhood. <laughs> I took public speaking with a number of kids that were much older than me in college, and uh, and I knew it was going to be additional nerves and additional uh, you know pressures that were put on it because I didn't know the kids in my class. I didn't take it with my friends. Yeah, and it just so happened that that teacher you know pulled me aside one day. These little comments that we don't think much of as adults, and said, 
Have you ever thought about being an attorney? Have you ever thought about uh, actually presenting and communicating as something you do in life? And honestly, I hadn't at that point thought wow. of it, but that, that comment stayed with me, that thought stayed with me. And in addition to playing basketball, I applied to law school, got into law school, mm -hmm. and I did it aimed at someday being up in front of juries and presenting a case. Awesome, yeah. I, I had no idea about that. Now, let's talk about your family, your wife, Emily, and your two sons. Can you share with me about them? Sure, I, uh, I trial attorney, and my first job took me to the islands. So I was in the United States Navy. Uh, I took a job as a trial attorney with the Navy and got stationed out here in Pearl Harbor. Uh, and not too long after, uh, I met my wife. I met Emily out here. She still had years left in school, and she was actually in school in Massachusetts. So like the foundation of any good relationship uh, I was near her family and she was near mine and uh, we were 5,000 miles apart. Uh, uh, but we met and eventually uh, even got to live in the same place together and start a family. I have two young boys, a 10 year old and a 13 year old, Evan and Cameron. Uh, so uh, it's, it's been a path. We, we moved around a little bit. We lived in DC for a while. We lived in the Bay Area for a while and we eventually made our way back home where I know uh, Emily always wanted to raise our two boys back here. and have them go to school back here and, and, and really sort of enjoy that idyllic uh, uh, time growing up that she had uh, back in the islands, back in Oahu. Yeah, I, I knew of Emily because I know her brother and sister, Brad and Cecily, and Brad was on my Punahou Boys varsity right. tennis team when I first started as right. head coach. So they have just a, a great family. I mean, they're, her parents, amazing people. Yeah, I won the lottery with that one. I, I, picked, <laughs> yeah. I picked right that one. Married into a wonderful family, I really did. For sure. Yeah. Now, you are also a law professor. Can you tell me about where you are a law professor at? Sure, so I, I went from being a trial attorney full-time to essentially starting to help out on the side. A lot of us that teach, uh, you end up teaching, uh, volunteering on the side, nights and weekends type of thing, and connecting with your own students. Uh, and that's what I started doing. I started doing it in D.C., uh, and then when I went to the Bay Area, I started helping out at a school there, and eventually an opening uh, came up, a full-time professorship, and I had never thought about doing that, much like I had never thought about becoming a lawyer or a trial attorney. Uh, and I decided I really enjoyed on those long days, especially when I was litigating and in court, I looked forward to the time that I would get to be with my students. Yeah. I would get to move them along and help them work on their project and help them connect up with what could be in their future for them. So. Uh, I applied and I became a, uh, became a law professor in San Francisco. Uh, I did that full time for about seven years and was a tenured professor. I got to work on something that really, you know, kind of, it helped me out in, in thinking about athletics and how I grew up and all the great coaches I had. I, I was a skills professor, an advocacy professor, which means I essentially took a coaching approach to being a law professor. I taught students how to uh, communicate effectively, how to operate in a courtroom, how to get evidence in, how to present their case. Uh, and it was something that those students were going to have as part of their near future. They wanted the same thing and the same career that I had. So I was, I was training my future colleagues in the legal profession. Uh, and I still teach today. I teach at uh, UH at the Richardson School of Law. Uh, again, back to the nights and weekends, <laughs> things that are on the side. So it, it's, it's, it's a great pleasure to, in education, to have your batch of students that you're handing something to them and you're, and you're making a piece of their future different because you interacted with them. And I loved um, the picture that we showed earlier about you know, how you met, you and Emily met Justice Sotomayor. How was that experience? I did, I like to tell my students I did that just for the, you know, I teach, uh, I teach a number of different uh, areas that Justice Sotomayor is now weighing in on, like the Confrontation Clause under constitutional law and, and criminal procedure. She came out with a key decision, so I like to flash that up on the screen just in case the students weren't with me yeah. and weren't listening to say, by the way, I might have gotten this lecture right here straight from uh, the justice that decided it. Uh, she actually, um, Justice Sotomayor uh, presided over a, a wedding of a friend of mine who his wife clerked for her when she was on the Second Circuit before the Supreme Court. So pretty awesome to meet her and, uh, and, and, it, and it does work well in, in class once in a while to put it up on the screen that I get a direct line to the Supreme Court. Yeah. <laughs> That's very cool. Yeah. Now let's talk about Father Damien. Uh, Father Damien in recent years is now Saint Damien. Can you tell me about how his legacy is carrying through currently? 
Absolutely, and, and, and this is a proud answer for us as a school community because uh, Father Damien, now St. Damien, is an important figure in Hawaii history just because of who he was and, uh, and why he came here and what he did when he came. That is, he, he came here to serve, and he came here to serve uh, the most marginalized in our society, literally those uh, put in Kalapapa and exiled and, and, uh, and, and put in a certain place because they had a condition that we didn't know what to do with at the time. And, and really just left on the outsides of society uh, while life moved on. Uh, and his mission was to think of others first, to serve others first, and to be there on the ground with them uh, as a daily activity. Uh, like any great, great person like, like St. Damien was, uh, I always think of this parts of the story that apply to our kids today. And, and our students at Damien, like a lot of, uh, a lot of high school students and K-12 students in Hawaii, they really do think of others first. They think about how they can serve their community. They think of how they can contribute on a larger scale. Uh, and for St. Damien, one thing that I always draw upon is that he was never supposed to come here. He was, a, he was a studying in, in Belgium, and his brother, his older brother, was a priest. And he was the one that was supposed to take this trip and engage in this mission. And when his brother fell ill, um, he had sort of an entrepreneurial thought. He had a seize the day thought. He wasn't yet trained uh, as a father that could serve in this ministry, but he said, I'm going to go. I think I'm supposed to go, and I'm going to go, and I'm going to help people, and I'm going to figure it out when I get there. And if that's not a great lesson for today's students of they're going to go into careers and into jobs that we don't even know about yet, that haven't been created yet, and they have to, as they're sitting here as ninth graders and 11th graders, say, I'm going to go. I'm going to figure it out there. I think that's what I'm supposed to be doing. So I think St. Damien has all kinds of practical applications for our students today. Yeah, he's definitely super inspirational, and, and so are you. And you're a great leader of Damien's school for the last three years now. And, you know, when I was there, it was just a high school. And in recent times, it starts from sixth grade now. How is that helping all of Damien right now to start at sixth grade? Oh, I like to think that what we're doing with the school now is, uh, is creating a school a community and a school culture where students, whenever they start, so we have students joining us, uh, essentially DOE makes a change and uh, they have more of their DOE schools that are ending uh, at fifth grade. Uh, so we react to what our community's needs are and we add a sixth grade at that time. We added middle school when we thought there might be an opportunity with, uh, with enrollment and a limited footprint of our campus. Uh, so for us, it's uh, it's important, it's who we are as a community, and we could flex again and iterate again to say maybe there'd be a, a bigger campus someday, maybe there'd be a different batch of students someday. Uh, I like to think that that campus was put in Kalihi, down the street from Bishop Museum, right down the hill from Kamehameha Schools. It was put in that area for a reason, because that's the families and the people we serve. Um, and, and we doubled down and we're there today because most of our students come from the immediate area, but we also have a, a broader application to a lot of Windward families, a lot of Eveside families, so we, we have students from all over. It's wonderful. I love that, and when I was at Damien, it was an all-boys school, and, and then you added girls six years ago, and that's just been a great addition. And you, President West, you've been doing incredible campus improvements. I absolutely love visiting the campus and seeing the Welcome Center and all of these improvements. Can you share what you've been doing? Sure. I mean, with the advent of young women and, and the changes to our, our school community, the other thing that always has to change, and I think all of us that are in education in 2018 talk about iteration and innovation and how do we hand it over to kids, how do we inspire kids to, to find their own path. And, and some of that is how we make changes with curriculum and how we change what happens in a classroom and other learning environments on campus. Some of it is just flat out changing campus. So. Uh, I want our experience, and I think my colleagues on the leadership team at the school want, our, want the experience of our students to be, they're going to have more entrusted to them, a little more, a little less rules, more freedom about where they can go. If they're eating lunch, it could be on a blanket outside in the grass. Uh, everyone doesn't have to be at a certain place at a certain time. We're taking advantage of some of our great partners in the community, so we have students that are regularly as part of a class walking down to Bishop Museum or or uh, gathering in different ad hoc areas that are not the classroom. So we're trying to sort of break down the traditional classroom walls, as a lot of schools are, and really think what's the best way for kids today to learn problem solving and learn some of the things that are going to be tools for them to take on those jobs that we don't even know what they are yet. I like that. And, you know, when I was there, we had to wear dress shirts, you know, dress pants, dress shoes, ties. 
and that has changed. It has, and it's not without uh, you know it's not without a lot of debate and discussion, and and, and frankly, some people uh, you know, aren't with it on some days. Uh, we look at it from the perspective of equality. Uh, we have young women on campus now, and uh, our boys were in their dress code with shirts and ties, as I was when I went to high school. And, uh, and our, our young women were, had sort of a uniform, and there were some inequities there. And we looked at it, we researched it, we actually looked at the data of what, what, do, what do students that are looking at a middle school or high school, what do they want to wear? What makes them comfortable to learn? What optimizes their learning? And we landed on, like a lot of other schools have migrated to, shorts and polo shirts, and we're in Hawaii, it's an outdoor campus. Uh, let's make students comfortable, let's make our school environment inviting, and let's get them in the best place where they can problem solve and they can learn for themselves. That sounds good to me. President West, we're gonna take a quick break, and then when we come back, we wanna continue going beyond education. Very good. You are watching Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii with my special guest, Wes Reber Porter. We'll be back in one minute. I'm Jay Fidel, Think Tech. Think Tech loves energy. I'm the host of Mina, Marco, and Me, which is Mina Morita, former chair of the PUC, former legislator, and uh, Energy Dynamics, a consulting organization in energy. Marco Mangelsdorf is the CEO of ProVision Solar in Hilo. Every two weeks, we talk about energy, everything about energy. Come around and watch us. We're on at noon on Mondays, every two weeks on ThinkTech. Aloha. Hello. My name is Stephanie Mock, and I'm one of three hosts of Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii Food and Farmer series. Our other hosts are Matt Johnson and Pamai Weigert, and we talk to those who are in the fields and behind the scenes of our local food system. We talk to farmers, chefs, restaurateurs, and more to learn more about what goes into sustainable agriculture here in Hawaii. We are on at Thursdays at 4 p.m., and we hope we'll see you next time. Welcome back to Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. My special guest today is Wes Reber Porter. He is a former trial attorney, a law professor, and president and CEO of Damien Memorial School. And today, we are going beyond education. President Wes, coaching and sports, very, very important. Tell me about why you think sports is important at Damien School. Well, one, it's, I think coaching is important. I think if we look at what we want to do with students going forward, it's going to look a lot more like coaching than it looks like when we think of traditional teaching. Unfortunately, we, we've passed out of that era, long passed out of that era, when the teacher was the most knowledgeable in the room and was the, the sole source of information. And I had to, as a teacher, stand in front of the room and deliver that information. And all my students had to take notes and then regurgitate it back to me on an exam. Those days are gone. Uh, every kid's walking around with a supercomputer uh, on a phone in their pocket. Uh, so how can we take on challenges? How can we take on problems? And how can we be on the side of our students like a coach would? Um, we should be offering them some strategies. They should be uh, going out, taking a stab at it. If it works, great. If it doesn't, how can we assess and how can we improve for the next time? So much like the same way a coach on the tennis court, a coach on the basketball court, that we try to approach it with our students for. We're not talking to them during, right? We're taking little breaks and telling them in, uh, in their ear uh, before and after, uh, you know, how can, uh, how can teaching look like that? How can education look like that? That's, that's what I'm excited about. So I think there's a lot of analogies to be drawn because like us growing up, our students are going to school today, they are receptive to what happens on the field and on the courts. They're receptive to what's happening in sports. They know that model. They, that model works for them. We see improvement all the time in that model. How can we make education look like that? How can we make our, our subjects and our problem solving and our critical thinking and all the things that are important to what's going to be their future, how can we make it look more like coaching? I love that vision, and I like that philosophy. And you know, in terms of some specific sports now at Damien, I mean, there's cheerleading. And we, it's great that we can have our own cheerleaders now. Um, but the, the girls' volleyball team, the football, can you share about some of the exciting sports that's happening with Damien? We just have wonderful examples of exactly what I just described. There's great examples of just passionate coaches who are on the floor or working with their pocket of kids, their group of kids, or working across an entire program that care first about character, care first about their development, care about 
the interaction that they're having with that young person and the difference it's going to make in their life. Uh, when you operate that way and when you have that philosophy, and especially when that philosophy holds true, whether it's my, my wonderful football program at Damien and the success that it's had, whether it's our young women uh, in, in volleyball that are uh, on an undefeated season and having you know, that type of year that they're having, when you see those similarities and those leadership principles and those life lessons are showing up across, across campus, it can't help but make its way into those student conversations. Of course they're talking about it, of course they're thinking about it, and how can we make education mimic it? That's our challenge. That's what the adults have to figure out. That's why you're a great leader. <laughs> <laughs> now let's talk football. Uh, the head coach, Coach Eddie Klineski, super incredibly great guy. He's so focused on really developing the character of his student athletes. Can you share more about how awesome Coach Eddie is? Yeah, it's an easy conversation because he is awesome. And it, it's, uh, he's one of those shining examples on our campus of someone that's, that's known. And he, of course, had his own, his own career and his own fame at UH and, and the player he was. But he's known for being someone that cares about young people on our campus. He's known for someone that gets the best out of the young people that choose to play football at Damien. Uh, there's a reason why if you're a football player at Damien in the last batch of years and you're coming back to campus, you're going to call upon Coach Eddie and go visit him, right? Because that's the, that's the type of in interaction and impact that he had on these young people. And it's that philosophy first. It doesn't have anything to do with the X's and O's. It doesn't even have to do with wins and losses, even though that part's working itself out for Coach. Uh, it's more how do, you, how do you care about young people and care about their development and get them to you know, the best version of themselves possible. Yeah, I totally agree, and Coach Eddie definitely goes beyond the lines. And speaking of beyond the lines, I, you were at my book signing yes, at yes. Barnes & Noble. I totally was excited to see you there. Um, can you tell me what you like about the book, Beyond the Lines? There's, a, there's an analogy to draw up with education. Uh, a lot of times, like I'm, uh, like I'm talking about here today, we can't stand in front of students and just say, here's what I need you to learn. Please leave, leave the room and learn it. Go read this in a book. and it, it's, it's smuggled, for lack of a better word. We have to tell stories. We have to talk about situations. We have to talk about problems that we're confronting now. And they should start to glean and see leadership lessons. And it doesn't have to come from someone that has a position or a rank of a, of a, of a leader. It comes from everyone. It can come from their classmates. It can come from their siblings. It can come from their parents. It come from anyone. And I love that about the book because it tells stories. And it will tell a story about uh, you know, a younger player on the team that's decidedly better but wants to, you know, step aside on the team to make sure that some senior has, you know, the senior year that they envision and has, has the limelight. There's a leadership lesson in there, even though that student, that tennis player, never thought that they were acting as a leader or didn't do it to become a leader that day and certainly didn't have the title or, or rank of a leader. So the idea that you can read a book and you can hand a book to young people to say, read these stories, and then everyone comes away with something different. That's, that's a lot what we're trying to do in education. And we need more leadership training in education. We need, we need a class, a seminar, an ad hoc group that's getting together that's doing the hard work uh, of pulling apart all the lessons that are available in your book. I totally agree. I, I love what you just said there. And I, I was very proud to be a part of my Damien tennis team, my teammates to do a big bulk donation of books to you and Damien School. Um, how, how was the reactions to the kids when you presented them a book? Well, it's twofold. The, the first part of it, 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 it's awesome that a kid's getting a, a, at school a gift in any respect. Right? If you're walking up to a child during the day and you're saying, hey, I'm giving you this, I'm giving you this gift today in your ordinary school day, it doesn't have anything to do with the class, anything to do with your grades, anything to do with your extracurricular, one, you've already, well, why me? What did I do? Why do I deserve this? The second part of it that I think is so important, especially for young people and especially for the young people that, that I, I'm blessed to work with every day at Damien, um, it, it's a symbol in and of itself that here's someone that walked the same hallways you walked. Here's someone that had a, uh, grew up on the same island and had the same path as you that's, that's writing about leadership, that's talking about his success. Um, and there's a vision for you in there. There's a way to think about you and the leader you're going to become. There's a way to think about you and the role that you're going to serve in society. It, it, it's awesome. We, we make sure they know every great story 
uh, everyone that we know, and we'd love to share more of the great people that have passed the halls in Damien and that they, they walk in those footsteps. Uh, so I think it's twofold. It's really awesome. I love, I love hearing that, too. Yeah. And it's, you know, I hope that we can do more book donations of Beyond the Lines to Damien. Uh, we've been doing that to some other schools as well. But, yeah, if we can get more books to you, that would be awesome. Now, I want to ask you some questions that directly relate to the book, President West. Mm -hmm. You're very inspirational. You're very successful. How do you define success? I think success has to do with meaning, has to do with fulfillment. Um, why, why are we waking up in the morning? What are you off to do? Uh, if you can't think about your contribution every day as having some meaning and some personal fulfillment to you, uh, and oftentimes when you put it in terms of meaning and fulfillment, uh, it's going to have to do with how you serve others and how you make uh, the place you live and the place your kids go to school and the place, uh, you know, your friends and their kids and their families grow up. How do you make it a better place and how do you, uh, how do you contribute? So I think success for me is that um, I've been able to get into some of these positions that hopefully maximize and multiply that impact, to, that make it a better place, uh, that I find meaning and fulfillment in my job than I do. Great. And, you know, every successful person, they've dealt with obstacles along the way. What do you think was your greatest obstacle in achieving your success, and how did you overcome that? We give too much thought to, um, to the parts of our history or the parts of our resume or the parts that we're just, that we're, we're less proud of. We give too much thought to other people's opinions. Uh, and I don't think I was any different in that. You know, you can look at it and say, oh, I should have gone to this school, or I should have uh, done that internship, or I uh, should have done this as my first job, or I should have been this in life. Uh, and if you spend too much time focusing on negative opinions, if you focus too much time on the past and looking at what, what you could have done or should have done, uh, then you're going to miss out on a whole heck of a lot. So I, I know some of that's just a mindset we take into every day, but the, everything that we did in the past contributes to who we are today. Uh, so I just think about that. There's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of different twists and turns, but all of it uh, makes who I am today, and it and it and it and that too adds meaning and fulfillment and allows me to best serve uh, our students and their families. Yeah, the, the choices that we made in the past got us to where we are right now, and the, the choices that we make now, because knowledge is power, can really help us get to where we want to go. Absolutely. Now, what do you hope to aspire to achieve in your future? The big ticket one is, is education in general, and particularly education back here in Hawaii. Uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of fixed mindsets that dictate education and the, uh, and the landscape and what, we're, what we can do and what we're capable of in the realm of education. Uh, but if you're paying attention and if you see what's been going on, particularly back here in Hawaii over the last batch of years, you understand that there's lots of things that we have going for us in Hawaii that actually allow us to move education further at a much greater pace than other places. There's, there's places on the mainland where private, public, and charter school leaders don't even talk to each other. We meet regularly. Uh, there's places where uh, my kids go to a private school, I'm the head of a private school, I think only in a one dimension of a private school. In Hawaii, we have a sense of aloha and how we care for our kiki and how we, we all have families and neighbors and kids that we know go to so many different schools. And the idea of how do we raise the bar for education locally, that, that's, that's what I spend time thinking about. And I really, there's a lot of great thought leaders giving, uh, giving some important conversation, important thought to that topic. Uh, and I really think of Hawaii being one of those places where because of our culture, because of who we are, and because how we take care of one another, that we can be sort of a leader on the new wave of education, not the standardized testing, kids sitting in rows form of education that everyone's still holding on to. I, I love your insights, President West, and how you want teachers to become coaches. I mean, everyone should be a coach to really help everyone else in the best possible way. So I like the vision. I like where you want to take Damien Memorial School. And you're succeeding, and you've just been there three years. So. I know that I speak for a lot of the alumni that we're so proud, so appreciative, so fortunate to have someone like you as president and CEO. So I really want to thank, thank you for, for your thank time you. and being on the show today, President West. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it.
And thank you for watching Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. For more information about my book and my TV shows, visit my website, RustyKomori.com, and connect with me on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. I hope that my book and TV shows will inspire you to create your own superior culture of excellence and to find your greatness and help others find theirs. Aloha.